Hallelujah, right? And that means praise to Yah, which is Yahweh. Praise to the Lord. We're going to have a baptism today. That's going to be a praising the Lord, isn't it? We have one candidate for baptism who is um, in their 90s. Ben, right here, is going to get baptized. Yeah, that's going to be fantastic. Back in 2003, I took a trip to uh, Minsk, Belarus for the first time. I was contacted by uh, somebody from Campus Crusade for Christ when I showed a little bit of interest in teaching cross-culturally. Minsk, Belarus is a Russian-speaking country. When the Iron Curtain did fall, Campus Crusade for Christ decided that they were going to put Bible colleges in Moscow and Minsk and different other places. So I signed up to go for the first time to Minsk, Belarus for 19 days. I didn't know any other person who was leaving America to go there. I didn't know anybody in Minsk. I didn't know how much money to bring. I didn't know their money system. I didn't know how to convert any of it. I didn't know Russian, the language. The flight was going to be 15 hours, and as Cheryl was driving me to O'Hare Airport for my trip, I'm thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> I was totally out of my comfort zone. I was a little bit fearful. And I had to keep reminding myself, take courage, take courage, you can do this. I didn't have trouble with the Old Testament and teaching the Old Testament, I kind of like that. But teaching through an interpreter who would be telling me to slow down, they couldn't speak as fast as I was speaking. It was going to be a new experience. Take courage. The scripture we're going to be looking at today in Haggai chapter 2, they use that word, take courage, in the New American Standard a number of times. So I titled this sermon, Take Courage. Before we get back into the Gospel of Luke, I decided that for August that we would look at this little two-chapter book called Haggai. So if you don't know where it is, you can go to the index, or you can go to the book of Matthew, which is the first gospel, and go backwards three books. Go past Malachi, go past Zechariah, and you'll get to Haggai. If you're using the Bible that we provide here, it's on page 669 of the Old Testament, 669. So let me read the first nine verses in chapter 2. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations. Hold on, I got to turn the page. And they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Before we look at this, will you join me in prayer? Lord, we just got through singing. Hallelujah, praise to you. Now open our eyes, help us to understand this text of scripture. And most of all, 
something that was written so long ago to a certain individual people, Judah, about Jerusalem and the temple, what does that have to do with us today? So open our eyes, Lord. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. A few weeks ago, we started this study on Haggai. We looked at the first of four messages that Haggai, through the word of the Lord, is given to the people in Judah. The message is coming to a man named Zerubbabel. He's the governor. He's a descendant of King David. He's in the line of Jesus Christ. And it's coming to Joshua, the high priest, and to the returning remnants, those that were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. 50,000 returned when Cyrus issued a decree from Persia saying they could return and rebuild. Last week and the week prior, we looked at chapter 1 where the Lord says to the people, you need to consider your ways in verse Five of chapter 1. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And he's telling them to consider their ways because they were using all their resources for their personal pleasures, building their own homes while the house of the Lord was in disarray. It was desolate. It was lying in ruins. When the people came back under Cyrus's decree, they began immediately to build the house of the Lord. They laid the foundation. And then in Ezra chapter 4, which gives you the historical version of this, Ezra chapter 4, some opponents come to them and saying, what are you doing? We're going to send a letter to the king of Persia and inform them that you're building this temple and this city has always been a rebellious city. So the Persian king sends a message back. This is not Cyrus, but probably his son, Cambyses. He sends a message back and tells them, this city is rebellious. Make them stop building. And for 15 years, they stopped building. And finally, the Lord speaks through Haggai, tells them, consider your ways. You should be building the house of the Lord, not your own homes. And last week, we saw in Chapter 1, verse 12, the people obeyed the prophet. I love that. They obeyed the word of the Lord. And they began to rebuild. And the last verse of chapter 1 says, On the 24th day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king, they were building. In 23 days from the initial mention of the prophecy, the prophet, we have them starting to build. Now, verse 1 tells us we're in the next month. It's almost one month has gone by when this next message comes. And my theme this morning is simply this. When you are active in the Lord's work, be strong and press on. That's pretty simple, right? When you're active in the Lord's work, be strong and press on. In verse 2, we're told that the recipients of Haggai's message are Zerubbabel and Joshua and the 50,000 plus more in 15 years called the remnant. You see that the date is the seventh month, 21st day. In the seventh month of the Israelite people, the Jewish people, it's a festival month. And the 15th of the month begins what's called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it lasts for seven days. And so when it says the 21st day of the seventh month, we're talking about the last day of the Feast of Booths. In other words, for the whole week, there's been no work being done because they've been celebrating this Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. So they've been working for three weeks. They're taking a week off for festival. But we saw in chapter 1 that God has sent the drought on the land because that they were doing their own thing rather than God's thing. And so here you're having a feast with how much food? Probably very little food. That could be kind of discouraging. And so my points are, when you're active in the Lord's work, be strong and press on, and don't let discouragement stop you. Don't let discouragement stop you from doing what the Lord's calling you to do. And sometimes discouragement comes from within. We see that in verse 3. The Lord himself is posing these questions to the people, to Zerubbabel and to Joshua. 
He says, who is left among you who saw this house or this temple in its former glory? Solomon had built the temple. The temple was erected and it was finally destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. The current time is 520. 86 minus 520 is 66 years. So who are the ones who saw the former house, the former temple? (laughs) The seniors. People over 66 and probably... 70s, 80s, maybe 90s. They're the ones who saw Solomon's temple in its glory. Here's what it says when Solomon's building the temple in 1 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. And then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The inner sanctuary is what we call the Holy of Holies. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height, and he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid the altar with cedar. So Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary, and he overlaid it with gold. He overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished, and the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid it with gold. What's the word that keeps popping up? Gold. In chapter 7, continuing on with the discourse about the temple, it says this in verse 48. Solomon made all the furniture which was in the house of the Lord, the golden altar and the golden table on which the bread of presence sat, and the lampstand, five on the right side, five on the left, in front of the inner sanctuary, of pure gold, and the flowers and the lamps and the tongs, tongs of gold, and the cups and the snuffers and the bowls and the spoons and the fire pans of pure gold, and the hinges both of the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, and the doors of the house, that is the nave, of of gold when this work of King Solomon was performed and finished what did it look like you saw gold so in verse 3 of Haggai they've been at work for three weeks now and then took a week off for the festival for for three weeks they've been clearing out the rubble and in verse 8 of chapter 1 the Lord says go up to the mountains get wood get the trees get the wood So if they have any part of the building built yet, what is built? A wooden structure framed out where the temple mount was, okay? So how many of you have seen the golden temple that Solomon built? Well, the older people. And so the second question in verse 3 is, how do you see it now? (laughs) By the way, how do you see it now? And then the Lord says in the third question, does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? And what's the answer? Yeah, it seems like nothing in comparison. See, when you start making comparisons, discouragement sets in. No matter where you are in the Christian life, when you start to compare yourself with somebody else in their work for the Lord, you immediately start getting discouraged. This structure is unimpressive, it's inferior, it's only a shadow of the previous temple. Sometimes discouraging comes within when you start making comparisons in the Christian life. And sometimes discouragement comes from the outside. Now this is not in the text, but I think it's relevant because Ezra had written about this time. Here's what it says in Ezra chapter 5. Remember, Ezra 4 was when the peoples around Judah got them to stop building. Here's Ezra 5. Verse 1. When the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edu prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them supporting them. Okay, that's the, our time period. 
At that time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, this is beyond the Euphrates River, and Sether, see these are why it's hard to read Old Testament, and Sether, Bozani, and their colleagues came to them and spoke to them thus, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish this structure? Okay? The neighboring governors got together. They're coming there and says, who gave you permission to do this? Then we told them accordingly what the names of the men were who were re re reconstructing this building. If you kept on reading in Ezra chapter 5, then Tatsunai sends a letter to the king of Persia with all their names of the people who are rebuilding. Could that be kind of discouraging, wondering if the Persian army is going to come to make you stop building what was referred to as a rebellious city in chapter 4 of Ezra? Sometimes discouragement comes from within you, and sometimes it's on the outside. And you know, when you begin to work for the Lord, no matter what you're doing for the Lord... Discouragement comes quickly. Suppose you decide to step out to help out with student ministries. Okay, I'm plugging you, Jason, okay? He wants helpers on Wednesday night and Sunday night. Suppose you decide to step out as a volunteer. Suppose in children's ministry, whether it's on Sundays or Wednesdays also, you decide, I'm going to step out and be a helper. I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a leader. Suppose you step out to say, I'm going to host a life group this year. I'm going to talk to Tony and say, I'm going to open up my home to host a life group. There's a whole lot of different occupations or ministries we have here that we need volunteers. Well, let me tell you, it won't take long before you will have internal doubts and discouragement. Am I really making a difference? Maybe three weeks into serving, you're going to be thinking, am I really making a difference? Am I really making this ministry any better? And by the way, why aren't other people helping? Surely someone better skilled than I should be doing this. And besides, I'm getting pushback from my friends and my family that I'm spending way too much on church stuff. See, discouragement comes from within. You start thinking that you don't matter. Sometimes discouragement comes from without. Why are you spending so much time at church? What Haggai is telling us today is stay the course. Keep working for the Lord. Don't let discouragement stop you. And as we see in verses 4 and 5, Haggai, through the word of the Lord, is telling the people, he says, be encouraged because the Lord is with you. Be encouraged, the Lord is with you. Three times in verse 4, the Lord says, take courage. But now, take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord. This is not Haggai telling them to take courage. This is the Lord speaking to them. Take courage. Literally, the text says, be strong. That's what the English Standard Version says. That's what the New King James Version says. That's what the Holy Christian Service Bible says. That's even what the NIV says. Be strong. It's the better translation. The word there really is be strong. So the Lord's telling Zerubbabel, Joshua, and all the people, Yahweh is telling you be strong. But notice he says be strong for what purpose? Be strong and work. For I am with you. One month earlier, when we looked at chapter 1, verse 12, when the people obeyed and feared the Lord, the Lord declared to them these same words in verse 13, I am with you. Now they're into the building project just at the beginning stages of it, and they're getting discouraged because this temple that we're building looks nothing like the other temple. Am I just wasting my time? The Lord is saying, be strong. And work. I am with you. And the Lord also reminds them of the promise that he made at the Exodus when they were coming out of Egypt. 
He says, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Interestingly, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is called the Torah, those words are never found where God says, my spirit abides in your midst. The closest we have is Exodus 33, 14, where the Lord said, my spirit shall go with you, and my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. But he doesn't use the term my spirit, he uses the term my presence will go. And in our text here in Haggai, it says my spirit is abiding or my spirit is remaining. The word there really is my spirit is standing in your midst. It's standing in your midst. So let me ask you, how did God visibly show his presence with the Israelites when they were coming out of Egypt? What was standing in their midst all the time? Pillar. Pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. And here's what it says in Numbers chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. This takes place right after the spies come back, the 12 spies come back. Ten spies give a bad report, and the people say, well, we can't win. We might as well go back to Egypt. And the Lord shows up and says, I'm going to destroy this people, Moses. And Moses intercedes. And this is what Moses says in Numbers 14, 13. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it, for by your strength you brought up this people from their midst, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, for you, O Lord, are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them. That's the same word, stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. How did God's spirit stand among the people? In the pillar of fire and the pillar of clouds. With them the whole time of their exodus. And so what the Lord is saying here, he's saying, people, keep working. Be strong and work. Because just as my spirit was with them in the exodus, so my spirit is going to be with you at Builders right now. Don't give up. Keep working. And thirdly, since God is with them, he commands them, do not fear. Do you see that? Do not fear in verse 5 at the very end. I love biblical structure when I see it. Here's structure. In verses 4 and 5, we have command. We get this statement. We get another statement. And then we get another command. What are the commands at the beginning? Be strong, be strong, be strong and work. What's the statement? Well, I am with you. What's the next statement? My spirit stands with you. What's the final command? Do not fear. Isn't that kind of cool? Or am I the only one that sees what's called a chiasm in Scripture? You know, the Lord speaks these same kind of words, these same kind of thoughts. He gave the same word to Joshua after Moses' death when Joshua is to lead the people into the promised land. Here's what it says in Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. In other words, be strong and take the land. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law, he's talking about the scriptures, the Torah. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. How often? Day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. In other words, we read it in order to obey it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In those four verses, how many times did he say be strong and courageous? Three. Does the Lord say, I'm with you? Yes, he does. Does he say, do not fear? Yes, he said it this way. He says, uh, do not tremble, do not be dismayed. So the same thoughts that are in Haggai are here in Joshua. Joshua. 
chapter 1. And amazingly, David said the same thing to Solomon when he was building the temple the first time. In 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20, David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and what? That means work, right? Be strong and work. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Just as David told his son Solomon, be strong, work, do not fear, the Lord is with you. We have the same thing here in Haggai, the second time they're building the temple. We're beginning a new ministry year here at Faith Community Church. All the ministries are starting up again. And we have ministry needs. We call them service opportunities. We have needs. And perhaps God is nudging you this morning to get involved in some manner. And let me tell you, the word of God for you is this. Be strong. Be courageous. Enter into the service, into the work. God is with you. And don't fear. I know when you get involved in children's ministry and those kids are climbing all over, don't fear. You're still stronger than they are. And be strong. Work. God's spirit is with you. Do not fear. And let me tell you why. Point number three in your notes is be encouraged for the Lord has a fabulous future planned. I just had to throw the word fabulous in there. He's got a fabulous future plan. Look at verses 6 through 9 once more. Thus says the Lord of the heavenly armies, the Lord of hosts. Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and also the dry land. And I will shake all the nations. And they will come with the wealth of all nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Who's doing all the talking here? Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. The Lord of hosts. And here the focus is on the temple. In verses 7 and verse 9, he calls it this house. In verse 9, this place. God's got a fabulous future planned for this place, this temple. And if you notice as I was reading, these verbs are mostly in the future tense. Active. The Lord is the subject of these verbs. I am going to shake in verse 6. I will shake the nations in verse 7. I will fill this house with glory in verse 7. I will give peace in verse 9. Do you see it? Future. So when is this going to happen? Are these future promises for the near future or for the far future? Well, verse 6 says, in a little while. That makes you think of what? It's going to happen pretty soon. The near future. In verse 6, he says, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. How many think that's going to be literal? The Lord's going to actually shake the earth and the heavens. I don't know how it would happen if it's literal. I tend to think it's more symbolic, figurative. And I'm thinking, how can I explain this to you? And as I'm reading through my daily Bible reading calendar, my reading for yesterday was in Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, 13, the Lord says about Babylon. Now, understand this. Isaiah is written not during the Babylonian period, but when this Assyrian empire is forming and becoming great. Babylon is the one that defeats the Assyrians. 
And here now, Isaiah is writing hundreds of years before Babylon becomes powerful. He writes in Isaiah 13, 13, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken. That's the same word that's used in Haggai 2, 6. I will shake. The earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Now what's he talking about when he's shaking? It says in verse 17, I am going to stir up the Medes against them, against the Babylonians. And these Medes will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. Their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will they pity the children. And Babylon, the beauty of the kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What does it mean when he's shaken up the heavens and the earth? It means it's going to be something that is spectacular in fashion. It's going to be total. It's going to be some earthly event that's going to just shake things up. And verse 7, he says, I'm going to shake things up. I'm going to shake the nations, all the nations. I'm going to shake the nations for what purpose? Well, look at the text again. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all nations and I will fill this house, this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now that phrase, they will come with the wealth of all the nations, it looks easy in English, but it's very difficult in Hebrew. This is where I'm going to lose most of you. Most translations have the wealth or treasures of the nations will come to the temple. That's what the English Standard Version says. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The Holman Christian Bible says the same thing. The New American Bible says the same thing. The New Revised Standard Bible says the same thing. The New Living Translation has it a little different. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple, and I will fill this place with glory. Talking about wealth. The interesting thing here is the word there is not what? It's not wealth. It's not treasures in Hebrew. So let's assume it is. Here's the argument that Haggai is making, the Lord is making. If it is wealth or treasures, then the nations are going to come to the temple and deposit their wealth and treasures, and then the Lord's going to fill the temple with glory. After all, verse 8 informs us that the silver and gold really belong to the Lord anyway. And verse 9 says that the latter glory of the house, in other words, once it receives all these treasures from the nations, well, this is going to be greater than the former glory of Solomon's temple. If this is the case, when did this take place? Well, here is where I want you to turn back to Ezra. Okay, Turn back to Ezra in your Bibles. If you're using a Bible in the seat, it's on page 348. Remember, Ezra 5 is they wrote the letter to the king of Persia. All the people who are working on the temple, they don't know how the king is going to respond to this letter. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then King Darius issued a decree. This is the law. And a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. In Ekbatana, in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found and there was written in it as follows, memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers, and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. 
Also, let the gold and the silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took away from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be returned and brought to their places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. Now he addresses the guy who wrote the letter. Now, therefore, Tetzanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shether of Bozanai and your colleagues, the officials of the province beyond the river, keep away from there. In other words, don't make trouble. Leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree concerning that you are to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the Euphrates River and do it without delay. Who's going to bring the wealth to rebuild this temple? The outside nations. He says, whatever is needed both young bulls, rams, and lambs for the burnt offerings to the God of heaven and wheat and salt and wine and anointing oil. So the priests in Jerusalem, uh, they request, it is to be given to them with daily without delay that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king, meaning me, the king is writing, and his sons. And look at verse 11. And I issue a decree that any man who violates this edict a timber shall be drawn from his house, and he shall be impaled on it. Yeah. And his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who attempts to change it so as to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued this decree. Let it be carried out with all diligence. Who's going to pay for the rebuilding? Yeah, not the Jewish people. All the surrounding nations that really wanted the work stopped. And then in verse 13 and following, they, they did not want to be impaled on a spike, and so they hustled to obey the king's edict. So then Haggai chapter 2, it would go this way. The wealth of the nations, the treasuries of the nations will come to the temple and the Lord will fill this place with glory. And now the latter glory of this temple will be greater than the former. And by the time you get to Herod the Great, at the time of Jesus Christ, the temple in Jerusalem was a magnificent structure. So with that translation of wealth and treasuries to be paid to Israel for the rebuilding of the temple, there would be a near future fulfillment, right? I mean, while they're doing the work, those letters go in there, the letters coming back, and then they act. But is it possible that these future promises in verses 6 through 9 are really for a far future fulfillment? What do you mean? Well, as I said in verse 7, that middle section is very difficult to translate. The easy words are these, and they will come, you get a word, and then you get the phrase, of all the nations. And they will come, some word, and you get, of all these nations. Now, the word there is not wealth. The word there is not treasures. The word there is the word desire. Or delight. And the word there is in the singular form, while the verbal is they will come. It's plural. Makes it very difficult. So the NIV translates it like this. I will shake all nations. Here's the phrase. And what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory. What is desired by all nations? Are they talking about wealth? Or are they talking about something else? Peace or maybe a person? The scriptures in 1 Samuel 9.20 talk about Saul when he's being presented by Samuel as the first king. It calls Saul 
the desire of Israel. The person, the desire, is Saul. Now, the New King James Version says, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory. They shall come to the desire of all nations. King James is trying to make it really clear that they see it as a person, not the wealth or treasures, but a person is going to come. And in my study, I read that most of the ancient rabbis always looked at Haggai 2.7 as messianic, about the coming Messiah. And Jerome, the one who translated the Hebrew and Greek scriptures into Latin for the Catholic Church, he also gave the word a messianic meaning. Meaning the desire of nations is Jesus. Therefore, When Jesus comes, then the Lord is going to fill the temple with glory. When Jesus comes, then the Lord is going to bring on that place peace. And he's also called a prince of peace, isn't he? So when the Christmas songwriters like Charles Wesley come along, notice what they say. Here's come thou long expected Jesus. You know that song? Here's the first verse. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art. Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Charles Wesley wrote the desire as being who? Jesus. Dear desire of every nation. From this passage. Angels from the realms of glory. Verse 3 goes like this. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. Who is the great desire of nations, according to the Christmas songwriter? It's Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Verse 4. O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind. Desire of nations, Jesus, from Haggai 2.7. Now, I normally don't take my theology from Christmas songs or hymns in general. But I wonder, I wonder if God gave us an obscure passage, passage here in verse 7 to tell us that there is a near future meaning as well as a far future meaning about Jesus. I think so. Even with all the translation difficulty, I don't want you to miss today's theme. When active in the Lord's work, be strong and press on. Why? The Holy Spirit is with you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when you're active in ministry, no matter what the ministry might be, you're not doing the ministry in your own power. You're doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit who's in you. Don't let fear stop you from serving our Lord. We always think in our minds, I won't be any good at this. And we let fear stop you from serving. And let me tell you, when you're strong and courageous and you're doing the work of the Lord, knowing that it's the Spirit of God in you doing the work, and you don't let fear stop you, I want you to be encouraged that the Lord has a fabulous reward set up for you. Ministry is hard. It's not easy. It's hard work. Ministry is hard, but when you're faithful to it and you're doing it in the power of the Spirit and you're not letting fear sidetrack you, there's a future reward for you, isn't there? God promises you a future reward. And it's going to be fabulous. So church, what's the message for us? Be strong and work. God is with you. Don't fear. 
and he's got a great re reward waiting for you one day. Lord, we come before you thanking you for what we've been learning. You told Joshua to be strong and courageous. Pay attention to the word of God. Act on the word of God. You'll have success. Don't fear. You were with them. You're telling the people of Haggai's day, even though the nations around them and the great nation of Persia, the empire at that time, he's telling them to be strong. Work. That you are going to shake up, Lord. You're going to shake up the world events. So, Lord, you're telling us here at the church, if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, we also have the Holy Spirit. And if we are believers in Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's also given us a gift. And we are to use that gift in ministry. So as a church, Lord, help us all to be strong, not to fear, that we would work, knowing that you're with us. So Lord, may we act on the truth we've received. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we close today?
And Hosanna means save now, save now. It's actually, actually when they're riding in on the triumphant tree, uh, what we call Palm Sunday, they're shouting Hosanna, but they're meaning save us now, save us now. And did he save us then? Not the way they thought. He saved us by dying on the cross a few days later. We sang that song because we're going to shout Hosanna, Jesus saves. And today we have a baptism service and we have a number of people being baptized and it symbolizes the fact that Jesus has saved us. We're part of God's family. I want the world to know, at least the people who are there, to know I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And today, if you still are debating, well, should, I, should I not get baptized? My comment to you is be strong act the lord is with you do not fear okay get baptized show people that you're a follower of jesus christ so if you want to get baptized it's not too late come up here i've got some information for you it shows you where it's at it's on mcconnell road it starts at two o'clock the baptism is actually at 2 30 don't come at 2 30 you'll miss a couple people kevin it was one of the highlights of last year for you wasn't it it was okay Kevin's in our wheelchair over here, um, and he got baptized last year at this time. So if you want to get baptized, see me right after this service. It's not too late. Also, if you're a member in a regular tender, you know what those boxes on the walls are for, and I need not say anything more. If you are a visitor with us this morning, you're our guest, please sign the Friendship Register. Go out to the Commons and go to the Information Center counter. We have some things to give you there to let us, you know about our church. Have a great week. I hope to see most of you at the baptism at two. Have a great week in our Lord Jesus.